This is the computer that I brought back from me from VCF West. This is the YCAT 150WS. It looks like an all-in-one machine, and it kind of is. It's an Intel multi-bus architecture with a Motorola 68000, and it actually can run either its own operating system for interactive training purposes, or it runs a version of Uniplus Unix and can support multiple terminals. As you can see right now, the display on it's a little freaky. It has this weird bastardized um, text terminal that's built into it, and that's what's called its video display. I'm going to deal with that at a future date because right now I can't even use the terminal because the keyboard's giving me grief. And as you've probably noticed here already, the keyboard is dismantled and sitting in front of me here. It does work, however, even though the display here is flashing and giving grid lines, I'm pretty sure it's a problem with the display controller for this here. If I are actually to touch the conductive pads on the unit, you might actually be able to see it is entering text, but it seems to be acting somewhat erratic for me typing like this. Like, why is this light turning on and off? That is actually the caps lock light over there. It should not be working when I push any of these other buttons. And one of the reasons is because I'm not actually enter or uh, closing the contacts on this like it's expecting to. With most keyboards, you have some sort of switch, a carbon pad that touches a set of traces, um, some sort of spring technology, so little tiny like leaf contacts. This is manufactured by a company called Keytronic. Keytronic came to fame by being incredibly cheap. Instead of having a physical switch mechanism, they were instead using a foam puck with a semiconductive pad on it. In reality, it's not conductive at all. I have an example of one of these pads just sitting over here in the corner. And if I grab my multimeter, the pad itself is not actually conductive. There's no beep. And yes, it is in continuity mode. Yes, of course, the contact that it touches is conductive but it still needs that connection to close somehow. And there's a little bit of a misconception that believes that these here are um, foil on foam pads, when in the reality, you're looking at a piece of metalized mylar film. The back side, which is actually against the foam, may actually be the electrically conductive side, but the side facing out is essentially laminated over, so it's actually never a metal contact. And yet, when I push the caps lock button with this pad on my finger, the light turns on. It turns off. And when I type any of these other buttons here, which previously were causing the caps lock light to erroneously turn on, I am having stuff entered on the screen. I should be. Yes, I am. Um, it's not actually registering anymore that the caps lock is being pushed by accident. It really wants a specific type of pad in order for these keyboards to work. Which is fun to say that making a product that uses an open uh, cell foam doesn't hold up to time all that well. Here, let me turn this machine off. There we go. So the keyboard assembly is one thing, and this is the actual keypads themselves. Let me zoom in on this here. Now, as you can see here, we have a bunch of these circular um, capacitive pads, which I've already replaced in here. But you can see that there's other pads in here which don't look as shiny or something weird's going on. What's happened is that either the bonding adhesive that keeps that pad onto the foam has attacked the mylar back coating and the metallic coating on that and has basically removed it, thus nullifying the capacitive effect of the pad. Or what has happened is that, and I'm going to try and pop one out here. Nope, you can't do it. There we go. And with that there, it also then breaks apart and I get bits of foam everywhere. The foam has basically broken down. As a result, you get the, my the thick mylar pad that was used to snap this one in and what's left of the original mylar pad, which as you can see has pretty much no metallized material on it anymore. Anyways, for many years, you could actually contact Keytronic and they would sell you each pad for, I think like seven cents each, but the shipping was kind of ridiculous, so you might as well just get an entire rebuild kit for it. When Keytronic stopped doing that, or if you didn't want to pay for that there, there was this limbo area in the 2010s where no one could really rebuild Keytronic keypads unless they made the parts themselves. Like, there were a few people out there that were building pads, 
but it was in limited runs. They were very small. I am not going to say that Texelec is doing the devil's work here. Texelec is actually doing a fantastic job, and they were able to commercialize on the shortage and this constantly failing pile of keyboards. Texelec sells a complete repadding kit, and it costs about eh, $25 plus shipping. And that's totally fine. For the gross majority of people out there, paying that kind of money to get this done, not a problem. I have two problems. The first one is that I live in Canada, so when I order a kit like that, after shipping, it costs me between $55 to $60 Canadian. In context here, that's about a half tank of gas in my car. The other issue is that if I want to order multiples, the exchange rate really comes to bite me. This is one keyboard. I have a Wang Professional system that also needs its keypads done. I have an Apricot PCXI in the other room that also needs its pads done. There's at least five other machines I have in my collection that are just queued up to get their pads replaced. I would be looking at, if I were to buy exclusively from Texelec, I'd be looking at paying around $200 just for pads. I cannot see that as a financially viable option for me. I'm known to be quite frugal in that regard. However, I've made pads before. In fact, back in 2014, 2015, I was making pads for my Apple Lisa, and at that time I was able to develop a process which allowed me to make significant quantities of pads. In the meantime, I've seen other people have done that, but no one's really documented the process on how to do it, and there's a lot of strange variables. I always say that people who do retro writing, it's the equivalent to cooking crystal meth, because everyone has their own way, and each way involves weirdly harsh chemicals. There's no weirdly harsh chem chemicals involved here, but everyone has their own way. So in this video, it's craft time. We are going to make ourselves a large batch of capacitive foam pads. Now for us to start making these pads, there are a couple materials that we're going to require. These here are going to be difficult for me to portray to you exactly what items to get because availability may change not only by location, but by also which vendor is available to you. The most critical part of these foam pads is the foam itself. They are of a specific thickness, they are of a very specific density. Texelec over on the CC Talk mailing list and over on vcfed.org has an entire thread where they were just trying to figure out exactly what was perfect. I'm not looking for perfect, I just need working keyboards that also don't absolutely suck to work with. So ultimately what I settled on was this stuff right here. It's manufactured by a company called Proform, and it's um, open cell, medium density. You know what? The part number is available just over here. Go look this up and find something similar to that. The thickness of this material here is approximately about four millimeters. I think they're going for optimal is five millimeters by Texelec, so this is close enough. This here has a glossy non-stick surface on one side, and on the other side it peels away. It does have a rather tacky, rather dirty, uh, a rather tacky adhesive side on the other end. What we're also going to require is some sort of metallized mylar material. I went over to Dollarama, and they have these metallic sheets, or they're adhesive metal effect sheets. They actually come in a variety of colors and shades here. So we have silver, we have gold, and we have either like bronze or copper. These surfaces here are non-conductive as well. If I were to push this onto the keyboard, it'll do the exact same thing. But it also comes with a non-stick surface on the back of it, if I can get this off like that. So this is very thin. This has a thick non-stick waxed surface. We're actually going to use both sides of this material. So if you can find an equivalent to this, I don't know if your Dollarama is going to have this, if you have Dollarama at all, get this material because we're going to use all of this. We're also going to require a couple of tools. So the diameter of these pads, if I can remember where I put the disc that we just took out of that keyboard, we go. So the size of that pad is approximately about 11 millimeters. So I went down to my local Princess Auto. You may very well call it Harbor Freight yourself or wherever your cheap from overseas tool supplier is. And I got myself a six piece hollow punch set. 
I really don't care for all of these punches except for this one. This one is 7 16ths of an inch. When I compare to that one there, it is 11.2 millimeters. So this is close enough for what we're going to do. So this is going to be the punch that I'm going to be making all of our pads with. It has a hollow opening on it, so as I punch, I'm going to have pads popping out of there. It also has a nice sharp edge that, if we're careful, we're not actually going to have to resharpen this at any time. It should keep itself plenty sharp for what we're doing. We're also going to require a nice solid hammer for this. I'm going to be using this ball peen hammer. I also recommend that you get, in so get yourself a cutting mat. This one right here will do. We will not be doing our punching on this as it's going to damage the mat far before we finish with all of our pads. Get yourself a nice sharp knife. And I have myself a pair of tweezers here, which are gonna be quite helpful when I'm having to remove the pads in some cases or other jobs. You can also go with a pick or something equivalent to something like that. Lastly, what you're also going to need is a nice solid punching surface. This here can be very delicate to choose from just as much as the foam pads. If you have too hard of a surface, you're going to wear out your tool too quickly. If you have too soft of a surface, your punches are going to come out inconsistent and raggedy and really not look all that great. Also, you will just begin to wear out whatever punch surface you have. You'll just wear it completely out. To give you an example of this, I'm using this rather massive wood block here, and I have completely beat the crap out of this one side. This here is almost too soft for punching, but ultimately, it's working good enough for me, and I'll just kind of shear off a little bit more with the bandsaw, and I have a fresh surface to work with. Be careful, though, when you're dealing with surfaces like this, where you're going to end up with these large pits and gaps, is because as you begin punching around, if you double punch over an area that's already been punched, you'll end up with some pretty bad punches, some pretty bad cuts. They're not really all that usable. Likewise, you can see in a couple spots here, I've even dug wood material out of here. That'll all clear up once I saw this off. That is also in mind here that we're not dealing with a commercial or industrial operation. We could use a die punching system. We could use any number of more precise punching devices to make all of these pads. Honestly, my goal here was to be able to manufacture these at home with tools that I can readily get. Even though we're going to produce a lot of pads, we also can produce a lot of well, not usable pads. Anyways, the first thing we have to do before we can make any pads is actually manufacture the strips or the sandwich that is going to make up our core material. So first, let's start off by grabbing ourselves a sheet of our Mylar material here. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be using the cutting board yet. I'm just gonna place it on top of here and we shall start off by peeling the wax paper off the back. Don't tear it, don't damage it, please. Also, I do recommend that you have nice clean hands when you're doing this. Because you will have to grab it, you will have to try quite valiantly to prevent it from curling or folding onto itself. You may also have to fight with yourself to get the damn thing separated from your fingers. There we go. And now I'm gonna take my foam tape and the non-adhesive side, I am going to lay down onto the strip. You know what? That's a pretty ugly piece right there. Let's cut that off. There. Stick that. Stick that to me for the moment. That's easy enough. So I'll take our roll, clear everything away from over here, and then I'm just going to lay it down close to the edge and I have a hair that's stuck up there. Now I'll take my knife and I'll just cut that off. Where are these hairs coming from? There we go. And I'll take our next strip here, trying to do as squarely as possible and lay it down. Rinse and repeat. You may flip it over from time to time to see if you have these wrinkles that are going to be developing here. If that's the case, because it's such a loose adhesive bond right now, I can just go back and just reapply that 
and that helps clean it up a lot. Same goes if I accidentally like slap this down where I don't want it, that's fine. Just carefully peel it away. This is not a, it's not a high tack material yet. And the last piece here, I'm using inch and a half foam. You may get it in one inch or two inch foam. And I'm not actually gonna make it all the way here. That doesn't matter. That's still a lot of punchable material that we can get out of here. There we go. So I can slice that off. Whoops. And it may stick to your hand. Again, that's fine. Just stick it back down again. I'll take our excess foam and I'll set this off to the side. If I wanna do multiple runs at this, I'm just gonna do one sheet at a time. Then go with your knife and between each strip of foam, cut it off. Cut it off. Cut it off. Now I'm not gonna flip this over and trim this piece here yet, because now, remember that sheet of waxed material? You can use wax paper if this doesn't come with it. Really, you just need a surface that this won't stick to. And after all of that, grab this here, now that we have our sticky side facing, and I'm just gonna try and square that up with the sheet again. And lay it back down. And the same, same thing as before, we're going to have a little bit here that we're not actually going to get on. There. And now we can go back, cut off our excess material here, so I don't end up with a sticky mess constantly fighting me the whole way. Come on. There we go. Stick that to me. And now we can cut along here and release our material, which is ready for punching. The reason I'm doing this in steps here, applying one side, cutting it, flipping it over, applying it, and then cutting it again, is that once you have these all assembled, good luck trying to find the separating points between the pads without really having to work to find it. This just makes it that little bit easier. So I now have two, three, three and a half pieces. In theory, I should be able to get 26 pads punched from this piece of material right here. Really for this one here, any extra pieces, that's fantastic. So let's get ahead with the punching on this here. Like I've mentioned before, this is already pretty heavily punched. So I'll just flip it over to another side here and I'll start punching away. For that, take your tool with your foil side facing up. I'll put it in, I'll press it down, I'll grab my hammer, and it should be just two taps. There we go. And then I'll give the tool a little bit of a twist, and the pad comes right out. And I'm just going to force this one out here. Let's take a look at this. So this pad here is very clean. It's got a nice circle applied to it. I still have the wax paper that's applied to the back of it as well. It does, however, look a little bit crunched. So what happens is that a little bit of the adhesive material that's used to hold everything together will kind of hold the foam together. What I've found is that while you're punching, it will just naturally spring itself back apart and it'll never be a problem again. Sometimes, however, you have to go in with your fingers and just persuade the foam back apart. And then I'll throw that back into a pile and I'll continue punching on. Another thing, however, is that depending on the surface I'm punching on, that will also adversely affect how my punches are being done. I wanna be able to get my punches straight on with enough pressure that's transferring through the material and to the block. But the block itself also has to be nice and properly supported. When I punch these, I actually like to sit on the floor. A concrete floor or something resembling a very, very, very hard surface means the block itself isn't going to transfer downwards. The wooden table that I usually do my videos on 
seems like a nice solid surface, but in reality, even under high-speed camera, we can see there's a lot of movement underneath, which is just simply lost energy that could be used to make a much, much faster, sharper, cleaner punch. Speaking of sharp, eventually you will get gumming up to happen on the ends of your punching tool. What I recommend for that is some sort of degumming agent. WD-40, of all things, works really well. So I keep a can of that, and I keep a rag also nearby as well. And so when I start to run into weird ragginess with my pads, I could just simply clean the tool and continue back off where I was. After about 15 to 25 minutes, you're going to end up with what you see here. Uh, a pile of pads that you've punched out and the core that's left over from the material that you've punched out as well. So let's do a count on here to see how well I did. There's lots of meat left here, but honestly, I just, for the sake of a demonstration, I wasn't going to be too cocky and try and make them nice and close together. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times 2, 24, then per strip of that. And for this extra piece here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So that would be, let me pull out a calculator for this one here. 24 times 3 plus 7, 17. We made 89 pads. So that's almost the whole keyboard right there. So that was, that was easy enough. And we still have lots more foam and we still have lots more mylar material to work with here. So I'll just simply do it again and I'll definitely have enough here, if not more, to get one keyboard done. And it only takes me like, what, 45 minutes? Like, it may be a waste of time to you, but for me, whatever. I'm just gonna sit there and like a factory, just hammer these things out. Now, that isn't to say that every single pad that you're going to make is going to be absolutely perfect like all of these pads. You will always have defective pads. Here are a couple of examples that I've gotten. This one here, well, as you saw there, the foil just fell off on my finger. So this one here delaminated before we were able to get it done. This can be the result of a sticky tool, which just simply rips off the mylar before it's ready. I also have a couple here where you can see you have ragged edges. The ragged edges here are the result of either the tools getting dull on one side, or I didn't cleanly punch it on one side. You have to punch it straight. Now, just because you punch it straight on sometimes doesn't mean also that your tooling is going in straight. This pad here looks absolutely fantastic, yet when you look at it from the side, it's diagonal. So when you put that back into the keyboard, it may be centered in that key, but it's actually going to be rubbing up against the side of it. That can be susceptible then to jams, or it could even peel the mylar material off. And then you come into comical instances like this, where as you can see, it just like it, it didn't it never actually punched here it just pulled at the material this here is junk this is no good what i found is that it really does matter where you punch how you punch and what materials you use using that wooden block there with the foil facing up i'm finding i can typically get about 85 to 80 percent of the all these strips here to be actually good pads the rest of them have little tiny flaws or defects i don't want to deal with but because I'm going to do several runs of this, it doesn't matter. It just disappears into the rest of the rest of the run. And I'll have more than enough pads now, not only for this keyboard, but for other keyboards as well. So now that we have our pads punched out, we can put them back into the keyboard. Now, I have this nice little tray here. Let's get rid of that now. And what I like to do here is that I'll pre-grade all of these and I'll find my bad pads. So what you see here is already done. For you, you could just simply, as you put the pads back in, just do a visual inspection and make sure they're good before you drop them in. Now, this is where the pick tool comes in very handy. I'm gonna take a pad here, this one here, for example. Can I push up the key underneath? There we go. And I'll dig it out and I have to pop, there we go. There was a plastic disc that just rocketed off somewhere. That's my main complaint here is that it is recommended and I believe Texelec puts new hard plastic pads on the undersides of these. The idea is that that plastic pad clicks in here and that holds the whole pad together. But if you remember, we have an adhesive backing on these pads here. We just have them protected right now by that piece of wax paper. So once you clean the hole, make sure there's no foam dust in there, what I can do is just simply pull off 
that wax paper, which then leaves the adhesive behind. There we go. Or most of the adhesive behind. There we go. And then I can go with tweezers, push the key out, and then just place it down. And it is now sticking to the physical key itself. That key is now done. I can move on to the next one here. And I'm going to do that in my spare time off the video here because there's already multiple videos on how to replace these pads. You have now seen another way to do it. And in reality, the reason I made this video in the first place is for that exact reason. If you go onto Google, you will find two things. One is that it's going to recommend you the Texelec foam pad replacements, or two, it's going to recommend to you YouTube videos or forums, again, recommending the Texelec foam pad replacements. The purpose of this video is to prove that you don't necessarily need to buy the Texelec foam pads. If you so wish to, the materials that you require to make these pads yourself, if you are willing to spend the time to assemble the uh, components and then punch them out, can be done at home relatively easy and it doesn't take a ton of time. Now, I understand this also kind of goes into the equivalent of those people who say you don't need to go out and buy Twinkies. You can, you can make yourself your own homemade Twinkies, which sure, I'll enjoy spending several hours manufacturing baked goods that'll be eaten in a couple of minutes and they don't taste better. They really don't taste better. Don't, I don't like them. But I really hope that I have brought the point across and I hope you're educated now that you'll be willing to go out and get the tools, get the materials, and punch out some pads yourself. This is especially economical if you want to buy in large quantities. This isn't also to say that as of this video, Texelec is almost consistently sold out of those pads. I don't want to wait several weeks to have my order come in. I'll just make them now, and in the course of an afternoon on a weekend, I'll get all the pads I needed done. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video, and take a look at my other videos for more tutorials and other cool things I like to talk about. And until next time, have a good one. <laughs>